There we go. David Jennings, author of Systemology. Create time, reduce errors, and scale your profits with proven business systems. All the way from, uh, you're, you're, you're Swedish, right? Is that the accent? I'm picking up Swedish. <laughs> I think everybody will spot the Australian accent from down under. <laughs> <laughs> British, Australian, like it's all the same thing, right? No, That's no? it. Yeah. Pretty yeah, well, we, we're the ones that uh, ride the kangaroos to work. Oh, well, hey, I, I rode alligators to work in Louisiana. So, like, we're, we're like practically related. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks for the book. Um, thanks for carving out some time. It's your, uh, your Tuesday morning. Um, let me ask you something, man. Can we really create time? it possible we can are you just uh, selling books huh <laughs> it's a nice little uh spin on the save time i think it's uh we all obviously have limited time but a lot of business owners because they get caught in that busy work uh sometimes by freeing themselves up from that it almost feels like you're creating time because everybody feels like some of these things yeah. they have to do so um when you can get that off their plate uh it can be a bit of a game changer yeah it's um there's there's different types of entrepreneurs that like uh, i'm the president of our hoa do y'all have homeowners associations in australia yes yep okay so i i never envisioned myself even being on the board let alone the president but after covid i was so pissed off at how the board ran things and shut the pool down and I was just mad. So this another guy wanted to run. Well, he's a little bit older and very organized, very detail oriented. He's he's uh, kind of a fixer at this big conglomerate, international con conglomerate. They buy franchises and other businesses and fix them or chop them up. And so he's driven. This guy had a vision, right? I thought I'd be on the side. They make me president, but he was behind the scenes, like doing everything. Well, that was the problem. He did everything and now he's burned out and he just, yeah. I get a, I get a text message over the weekend, you know, Oh, by the way, uh, you know, cause we are, our, our board meeting is this upcoming Wednesday. And he says, yeah, that, that'll be my last day. What? Yeah. He, he started like all these major projects and he admitted he was spending 40 hours a month as an HOA <laughs> like yeah. vice president. <laughs> And now he's burned out. But like, it's like common for small businesses, isn't it? Yeah, it's like they have a picture in their head of what they're building. And that picture has them right in the middle of it. Oftentimes, they're the hairdresser who knows how to cut the hair. It's the um, landscape gardener who knows how to uh, work the gardens. It's the, the plumber who knows how to do the pipes. And then they start a business and very quickly they learn, hang on, there's a whole different set of skills required to run the business versus just doing the work like michael gerber talks about sort of that technician work and the picture they have in their head is them doing the work so they build a business like the picture in their head but then it's oftentimes very hard to change that because all of the success that they have in their business as they get the business up and running and off the ground that just reinforces the behavior that help them build this small successful business but then it's also what then traps them from moving beyond that and re reducing that um key person dependency yeah um can people learn this you know or are they just stubborn and you know have to almost fail i mean i've talked to a lot of people that you know they do learn it eventually but usually it's like they have to rise up from the ashes. They got to hit that rock bottom before it, their hard heads open up and, and listen to concepts like you cover. Yeah, I think, uh, and it varies, but the most common people that come into our world have got existing businesses with traction, small teams, right product to market fit, and they've been doing it for a good period of time but they're just finding they're on this treadmill and it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole and they're so solving the same problems again and again and again, whether it's with staff or clients. And it's that 
experience to then really that's what gets them to appreciate systems and processes and gets them thinking about hey this is unsustainable or i can see someone else building a business that looks like it's moving quicker than mine or isn't as dependent on them as mine this is something i need to figure out like for me also and i've seen it a few times where there's often a catalyst so for myself personally we found out we were pregnant and then I thought, I don't want to be the dad that's always too busy. And that was a big driving force for me. And similarly, a lot of the clients will have a catalyst. Sometimes it's um, a medical emergency in the family, or maybe the business owner is looking to exit. Um, but it's oftentimes you need something to really drive because a systems culture and building a systems driven business has challenges. It doesn't have automatic, like happen automatically. You don't see the great results straight away and you've really got to persist with it. So that driving force is often a critical component in making it happen and making it stick. Yeah. Um, is there a common area that you start with someone? Like more often than not, do you start with marketing or do you start with getting paid, you know, collecting funds? Is it back office, you know, operations? Yes. Like where anything common? The first step in systemology is, is to answer that question around where do we start and, and how do we identify the first 10 to 15 systems? So that the exercise that I go through is firstly, you map the linear journey that the primary uh, dream client goes through to purchase a primary product or service and you map this journey of grabbing their attention handling the incoming inquiry selling them onboarding them taking some money delivering the core product or service and then getting them to come back and we do that very high level first and then within that picture generally we ask where in there is the pain like what is the bit that the business owner thinks, oh, if I had 100 more clients, this bit breaks or a bit that they find personally painful or they don't like doing or they feel like they're the bottleneck. Uh, generally, that's the way that we uncover and it can vary. Some businesses, it's lead generation, some it's sales and also some of it is around delivery of the product or service. So, um, every business can be a little bit different. Oftentimes it depends on um, where the business owner's strengths tend to lie. Sometimes you'll find if a business owner is particularly strong at something, they tend to be the bottleneck at it um, because then they just feel like they're the one that has to do it and they're bringing some certain level of magic. But um, at least by starting in that critical client flow, and working within there where we're working towards at least getting to a point where the business can make money without that key person dependency and that's that's really the guiding light for where you start which is we want to make sure that the business can make money without the business owner's dependency without any of their key team members can the business make money regardless of which team members there and and if once you solve that problem you can actually fix just about any other problem in business yeah i do a thing i call my the ipa the initial process assessment yes and i and i walk them through and i tell them you know describe for me or document your current plus ideal process because usually they have yes either no process or very small well calls come in we talk to people we we take their money you know we we deliver okay yeah <laughs> how would you like it to be well we'd love for orders to come in and and then what you know and then it's assigned to operations or fulfillment and the and then the the manager calls and thanks them for coming on board okay how do you do that right we don't have any tools yeah, but usually they can't even think, they can't even envision it. I mean, it's almost yes. like like we just adopted this dog, right? And it was it was literally uh homeless, like 
eating out of a, they found it in the dumpster, got trapped in a dumpster. Right. Yeah. And so if your whole world is just a dumpster. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, peek your head out. No, it's okay. Like, there's a lot of food. What? Go run, go jump in the lake. It's okay. Like they can't even, they can't even envision that. Right. They can't think of automation and multimedia. Oh, I can do SMS and this can fulfill. And I can have a left. I can send mail chocolate to my customers automatically. Like what? Like, you know, how do you get them to even expand the the potential in their in their brain? One thing that we do, a lot of it has to do with creating space first. And to a certain extent, systemology. Um, what makes it different from everything that's come before it in the world of systems? Most of it is uh, process improvement, like Lean and Six Sigma, but that pre-assumes that you have a process that's a baseline and you're then looking to improve it. Systemology is actually almost like the step before what you were talking about there, which is process capture. And, and it's the first step of what you talked about, where we first say, what are you currently doing? Let's capture that. Let's go, well, who answers the phone the best? What is it that they're saying? Well, let's capture that because Sally does that really well. And then let's make that the new baseline and then have everybody do that. Because most small business, what they struggle with is consistency. And you can get tremendous wins by just being consistent and delivering something to a set standard and then it actually sets up for experts like yourself because the first thing that the consultant will say is well what are you currently doing and for a lot of businesses well there is no proper baseline they're not doing anything consistently it's all a little bit over the shop jenny does this sally does that bob does that and it makes it harder for the consultant to go, I don't have a baseline here. I'm, well, we're going to have to just re-engineer the process. Whereas um, what we do is it's almost like we set it up. And by saying, let's make it repeatable, capture what you're currently doing, not what you would like to be doing, that then creates enough space for the key team members to then start to go, how would we like it to be? And that's how the first step of getting out of the dumpster is to make sure that um, things are kind of operating and which it allows the business owner and those key team members to step out of the dumpster and then do the thinking and then re-engineer something or work with someone like yourself that then re-engineers the world-class process and then replaces the old one. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Uh, one of my, still one of my best client stories is all the way back in like it's like 2010 and this family owned daycare child care called me up and they're all the way in florida and i'm in california and like they didn't have the budget to fly me out there right so we're doing everything remote it took us 87 days and I know because the owner came on with my partner back then and did a 45 minute interview of how it went. Uh, yeah. And so we start out, I was an Infusionsoft partner. So we started out with their Infusionsoft, like improved some systems. We redid their website, improved the SEO, uh, did some like referral stuff of, of parents because they had, they had capacity for like 96 students, but they had 22 empty seats. Yeah. So that was all profit, right? Because they had to have, they already had the facility and they had enough teachers. So yes. the teachers yeah. just weren't full, right? And so, so we did all this. And so SEO, the websites pop in, leads are coming in and, and like sales weren't going up. And I'm like, what the hell? So I was like, just, just process of elimination. I'm like, walk me through this. So, so imagine this. So 13 years ago, you know, daycare, they're in a college town in Florida. So these nice young women, you know, have a whatever, you know, degree in teaching or in English or whatever, but and they, they want to work with kids. So they weren't paid very much, like like $36,000 a year back then. And this was the most expensive school in the city. So $200 a week 
right? So mm. 10 grand, if you do a year, it's 10 grand. So to a $36,000 a year, 25 year old, you know, single woman, that's the average teacher there. Cause anybody could take a call and you could come tour the facility at any time. So it was total chaos. Right. And so this parent walks in, they're interrupting classes. This teacher showing them around. Like, well, how much is it? You know, they were like, it's kind of a lot. Oh, so just like your, your exact example, yeah. who answered the phone, who does it the best. So we're like, okay, only the owners or the, the director of the school can talk to prospects. Everybody else answers the phone and takes a message. And then we narrowed it down to just two, two times per week, like Tuesday morning, Thursday afternoon, something like that for, to do tours. Yes. And then, and then I worked on the verbiage on how to talk to prospects, parents and bring them in. And, and so we, we, we streamlined that filled the school up immediately. Yeah. You know, because now we didn't have people that were afraid to talk money. And then we created demand because you you show up and then there's two or three or four other parents there touring at the same time. You're like jockeying for position. So now you're going to put a deposit down while you think about it. Right. But that would hold your seat. Bam. Filled it up. You know, so I've been I've been doing the same kind of stuff. So I just haven't been smart enough to write a book on it. <laughs> you Aussies are pretty smart. <laughs> I um I've read some of the classics like many business owners uh, like the E Myth and Traction and Built to Sell and sure. a lot of them they really built the case for why systems and I got bitten by the bug and I love it when I talk to uh, someone like yourself that is. Um, a specific like your your uh, a department expert you know sales inside and out and sales process you all un also understand the business bit but you kind of really double down on um, the sales side of things um there are when you can tell someone is great at what they do is when uh, in their department when they layer systems over the top of it as in or it's the the, the building blocks because what you're talking about there you're you're capturing the system and that applies in each of uh, the different departments. And I felt like when I read those, you know, e-myth, um, I, I got to the end and I thought, yeah, I want systems. I know I need systems. Like a lot of business owners intuitively know it, but then it's like, where do I get started? Like what comes first? What are the first systems? How do I get my team on board? Where am I going to save these systems? Um, you know, what happens if I get resistance and certain team members don't want to adopt this change? How do I navigate that? And that that was really what the inspiration was for me. It was kind of like, well, let's create the system for systemizing a business. Let's try and codify this and give more of a an action plan, a how-to guide. That was kind of, but it was, um, yeah, a bit of, bit of trial and error, working with a lot of businesses. But I now feel it's, it is the master skill in business as a business owner to be create effective business systems. Um, once you learn that skill, it actually touches every aspect of the business because you move into sales, marketing, finance, operations. And it's really just about how do we capture and codify best practice? How do we then uh, delegate those tasks down to less skilled team members to then free up the higher skilled team members so they can create that space and they can only work on the tasks that is going to add the most value to the business rather than just getting caught up in the busy work and things that have to happen. So it was kind yeah. of like a bit of that journey that's now made me realize um the better I can get at articulating this message and inspiring business owners to create systems. I think that's where we'll, I'll have the biggest impact. And that's why I thought the book, I was kind of like, you know, a book's a great way if the book's written really well and gets great feedback to reach a very large group of people without, you know, needing to speak to every single person one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's cool. You got the forward by Michael Gerber. I met him uh, through Infusionsoft. I actually had an event in San Diego. Well, yeah. a couple times I met him, but first time was in San Diego, like around 2010, 2009, somewhere in there. And um, yeah, smart dude. Um, and he really does break it down well into the, the three types, you know, and the E myth. It took me a long time. I didn't quite realize it. It's, it's the entrepreneur myth, right? Yes. So many people. So many people yep. fail on that. Like, what does it really mean to be an entrepreneur? And uh, and there's a lot to it. So, you know, I like that you get down to the basics. It's like, I, I'm that kind of guy. I want the nitty gritty, you know, because you see people all the time. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, my my wife got pregnant or, you know, I got laid off. And so I just started my own yeah. business. And, you know, now we do $10 million. It's like, go down a little bit. <laughs> yes, know? yes. Like, what? Uh, yeah, because the, everybody is a little bit different, but there are fundamentals uh, you can you you have to follow. And but I think uh, giving people even the hope, the inspiration, because sometimes it does seem too daunting. You yeah. know, when I heard my hired my first assistant, so I, I had gone back to corporate America. I'd started the Sales Whisperer, I had it kind of running, but kind of not. Um, I was recruited by some some peers, some old co -work, former co-workers, went back into high tech. It was just too lucrative. And I got seven kids. I'm like, I got to make some money. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm juggling two things. And I hired a, a local, a friend of mine knew someone. And so she would come to the house. And I was like, I was so overwhelmed, you know, multiple computers, yeah. you know. And I'm like, just sit, listen. And when there's something you can do, just do it. <laughs> you know, I yeah. like mute. <laughs> and she'd do that. And then and then kind of got her going. But I was like, you know, thank goodness she was local and can kind of look over my shoulder. But I know I'm not alone, right? Most people yeah. they get into business and and they're good at what they do and they wanna they wanna put their all into it, but then emails are piling up, invoices are piling up everything else yes. and you're like i gotta be the best web designer i can't do any and they've never done any other stuff because they were an employee and now they're on yeah. their own you know so you're giving them hope right I remember, like <laughs> um it sounds like you ran a digital agency uh also before um the systemology business and where I kind of really cut my teeth was in the digital agency. I had one called Melbourne SEO ran for 13 years. I was in the operations for 10 of it. And I remember one day, um, cause we had a video part to the business. We would create content for, um, people create YouTubes and thing. And I went out for a shoot with the videographer and, we only part, set up that part of the business, the video, because of demand. I didn't know how to do the thing. I'm not a camera guy. I don't know how to turn on the camera or do the editing or anything like that. And that whole exercise was what really helped me to understand how to build a business where you're not the guy because I couldn't work a camera up front. So from day one, I had to build this little sub part of that business that worked without me. And I remembered we went on a shoot one day with the videographer and we spent the entire time in the car and he's saying, um, oh, did we email the client to let them know not to wear checkered shirts because that doesn't look great on camera? Oh, did I pack the spare battery? Oh, did I have the extension cable? Oh, where's that second lens? And we spent 45 minutes in the car just talking about stuff that just should have been taken care of. And then at the end of that shoot, to, I said to him, look, we need to create a checklist, which is a pre-shoot checklist. And at the studio the night before, you put the battery on charge, you pack the kit, you have everything ready to go. So in the morning, you don't even have to give this a second thought. So we put that in place. And then about six months later, I go on another shoot. And the discussion that we had in that car was worlds apart. He's talking about how he wanted to get the performance from the actors, what the script was, what shots he wanted to get. Uh, and there's that for me was a big moment to kind of go systems. Like there's certain things in business that just need to happen. It's like the administrative side of things. 
and you just want that stuff to be taken care of. And when you're confident and comfortable that that's happening because you've created some systems and processes, it then creates the space for all of your creativity to come out. So that little connection for me, like running that sub business, having that experience with Adrian, that really shaped a lot of my thinking around systems and the importance and how systems that don't reduce creativity, they increase creativity because they create space for that creativity. Um, and you're right, a lot of business owners, they, especially if they're, as Michael Gerber talks about, it's the entrepreneur that has this entrepreneurial seizure or the technician that has an entrepreneurial seizure. They're really a technician and then they feel like, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, but they don't know all of those other bits. And I think the systems and the processes, if you dial that in, um, that helps to um, uncover areas of weakness because you're you're effectively codifying a solution you're going well here's a problem in business um when we go out on shoot sometimes we forget that spare battery well i'm going to create a system that makes sure that that doesn't happen next time i'm going to create a checklist now you solve that problem once and now it's forever sold because you're working at the system level because every time you're using that checklist now and that's what enables the business owner kind of to level up. It's the uh, compounding effect of all of these little systems, saving a bit of time, increasing a little bit of efficiency, all stacked on each other and in each of the different departments. There's some in sales, some in marketing, some in finance, some in HR. And it's the collection of those systems that really starts to transform things for the business owner and and you kind of just need to wax on, wax off, work through this process. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be the person documenting everything, uh, but you need to at least develop a way for you to capture best process and ha you know have a team member who does the documentation and a, a place to then store that knowledge so you can say to the team, well, this is how we do things here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I love what you're saying about it. it creates space for creativity. You know, I had a guy, uh, consultant I hired and years ago and I was telling him, man, I was, I was bored. I was just kind of in a rut and, and he hopped my ass, man. He's like, this is when the breakthroughs come, you know, stop chasing new things keep going deeper and you know and it makes sense because like when y'all were driving to that that appointment and you're in this kind of fight or flight state you're just anxious and do we have everything you're not thinking about the shoot yeah you know you're just trying to survive you're just trying to get by but as everything's documented now you're calm and you, you could see something a sunset or something you know you're like Hey, let's do this for this shoot. You know, a whole new thing comes to mind because you're open and receptive and you're not just full of cortisol, you know, amped up, like, hope I don't screw this up and, and have to refund this guy, you know, yes. but it does take a minute, right? You have to, maybe it takes hours. You got to sit down and say, okay, what are the 37 items we have to bring? Oh, and the battery has to be charged 24 hours early. Oh, and, we got to book a car, you know, a week early. Oh, we got to book our flights three weeks early. So, I mean, you got to, it may take time to build this whole document, everything, right? But yeah, look, there once are you do some, it, it's done. Yeah. And there are some things you can do one to speed up the process. And two, there's a chance that the business owner needs much less systems than they think they actually need. So, a lot of people, when they think about a systemized business, they think about something like McDonald's. Oh, McDonald's is really systemized. And then they go, well, I need to systemize my business like McDonald's. But if, there's a few things they don't consider. One, McDonald's has been doing this for 60 years. And if we look at how McDonald's is today, you don't start there. You actually want to go back and think, well, 
where did McDonald's get started 60 years ago? Like they obviously didn't have everything systemized from the start. Um, and also most people listening to this right now probably aren't running a hamburger shop and they're not recruiting 15 year old kids off the street to flip hamburgers. So they don't need that level of documentation for certain things because they might be hiring a players that are skilled to a certain level and can hit the ground running and might need less documentation and they need more of a framework. So there's a bit that goes on to first thinking about, um, you know, to what level of detail do these systems need to be documented and also who's going to be following the process. And we can also apply the 80, 20, like we think what are the 20% of the systems that are most important that deliver the result in each department. And let's just start there. Like if you focus on the five or the 10 critical systems in each department, that dramatically reduces down what needs to be documented. Um, because just because you don't document something doesn't mean it's going to magically stop happening. Like your business is already still <laughs> working and it's kind of running and you've got team members that are doing certain things. So all we're really doing is identifying the most important ones and doing that. And then the last tip I've got on this is, um, there are some little tricks you can do to reduce the burden of documentation because the business owner is often the worst person to be doing the documentation um, and things like make it a two person job. There's the person who knows how to do the task, the knowledgeable worker. And then you have a second person we call the systems champion. And that person watches the knowledgeable worker doing the thing. They record them doing it. So, when there's an inbound sales inquiry, well, we record some of those phone calls that happen. They go to the systems champion and then the systems champion used to listen to all of those and then pull the checklist from it. But now they can even get the transcript, feed it into AI, ask AI to pull out the key steps, mush it together. And then great. Now we've got version one of the checklist of here are the seven things that you say on an inbound inquiry phone call. And then you send it back to the knowledgeable worker and say, is this pretty good? Did I miss anything? And that's just version one. So it's little tricks like that around making it a two person job and dramatically reducing the number means that you can get traction much quicker than you might actually think. Yeah. Well, and that's good too. I mean, I was in the military and stationed overseas and we had to document, we had to create our, our, our scope of work, right? Our, our SOP, uh, standard operating procedures. And I, you know, when you're running advanced technology, after you do it for a while, you just, you just know, right. And like you were saying, you, things will still get done. Well, they get done by the expert. So, but I had to really sit down and go, what buttons do I click in what order to make this thing perform? And so then I got the, the least experienced person in our unit and sat him down and said, okay, we've just been overrun. I'm dead. You're the only one working the shift right now. And you got to make this thing work based on this, this journal go. So I had yeah. to see now in an ideal world, I would have had him sit with me and learn as we were going. Right. And, and maybe flip it yeah. around, have him do it. I, I tell him to do it. And then I document, uh, and he would have learned as he went, but either way, uh, but you know, and that's life or death, but from a business standpoint, it's life or death. I mean, I've had, you know, 600 plus, uh, entrepreneurs on this and a lot of people had, they had their back against the wall. Uh, John Jonas, I had, had him on you know, years ago and yeah. he created a, a virtual assistance business. Mm -hmm. uh, his, I think his wife, I don't know if they had children or maybe they were in the hospital had a health, had, it was a health issue. And so we only had limited hours to work. And so yeah. that drove him, you know, like I got to be super efficient. And so, so I'm saying, I, I like that you're doing this. That's always been my goal. Like how do I help the salesperson, the entrepreneur get better without hitting rock bottom, mm -mm. you know, 
uh, and a lot of times we can't. <laughs> so, but at yes. least here, here I, I can at least, you know, as they're laying there in a in a puddle of blood and drool, and go, hey, when you get better, uh, this book it'll be waiting for you <laughs> in 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 your hospital room. You know, when you can open your eyes, uh, maybe start reading that. <laughs> you know, yes. So at least they won't do it again. <laughs> You're like we're stubborn, Definitely. right? Sometimes yeah, it definitely listen. feels like um, you know the the teacher appears when the student is ready. So sometimes sure. some people need to hit that rock bottom to be ready and able to have their listening ears on. There are others who just intuitively get it or they've seen it somewhere else. Like I said, oftentimes it has to be it's the picture in your head. Like I also see other business owners if they've worked in larger businesses or more systems driven businesses once you actually see it you can't unsee it like the difference yeah. between a systems driven business and you know a chaos driven business it's night and day apart and you you can't imagine not running a systems driven business once you've seen it because yep. Every successful business that you know of that's grown and scaled and had any level of impact or really moved beyond key person dependency had to get systems and processes sorted at one point. Like there's actually no other way to do it. Like passing down that tribal knowledge will only get you so far and will cause challenges because you'll be so key person dependent. So it's a problem yeah. you have to solve. So it's a lot of it kind of you were talking about the idea of the military before what the military does so well. And now I can see why you're naturally a systems person is because it becomes part of your DNA. Like it's that would have been bred into you through the military. I see all the time a lot of business owners um, and people who resonate with the systems message with that military background because they know it works. And they've seen yeah. how important a checklist is and this is a life or death situation. And even if yeah. you're a pilot or a helicopter uh, pilot um, that has flown for, you know, 30 years, you still have a pre-flight checklist that you look at and you run through because that's standard protocol because that's how you stay safe and how you maintain consistency and ensure things get done so it's um yeah. you intuitively know that but some business owners they it's like they need to hit the rock bottom to go i can't take it anymore <laughs> but i i, yeah. I wish we could figure out a way for someone to see but hopefully yeah. something that we've said today might connect with them yeah for sure so i'll be uh, i'm linking to your book uh, i've got it in the show notes um your website is systemology.com, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And David Jenin. So J E N Y N S. I've never seen that last name. Is that an Aussie? Is that a common name in Australia? I think it might even be like Irish or something a few generations oh. back. And then we've moved to Australia. So, um, Yes, it's a, a peculiar one. Makes it easy to remember or hard to remember. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, easy enough. And it, it, it does stand out. So I found you on LinkedIn. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'll be linking uh, to your LinkedIn, your website, the book. Um, very cool. Well, thanks for carving time out of your Tuesday morning to come hang out with me. Yeah, absolute pleasure, Wes. Thanks for the time. Great seeing you. Have a great day.